as well. Now, as I said to you, I really want to open the floor to you guys, um, but I'll, I'll just start with one question myself so that people can kind of gather, <coughs> gather their thoughts. And Christy, you began this session on what was you know, the new reality, unconventional security challenges, cyber security, the hybrid threats that you're talking about. Um, and you gave us the pillars of you know, what we are trying to protect. So when you're talking about you know, being unified in our action and our speech and better communicating those cornerstones of democracy, how do you feel we should be using specific terminology? What tones should we be using? And how in our everyday talk or interactions with media can we be actually strengthening that? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question because I mean, first of all, we have to that what kind of societies do we have? We have small, in this reference group, we have relatively small countries where the fundamentals is the state in many cases. We trust our authorities, basically, in some countries more, in some countries less, and that's the foundation. And the rule of law is the building block of our society, which means that in that communication, this frame should always be kept in mind. Meaning that if we want to somehow regulate or limit, for instance, our communication, we have to do it with the tools that we have at our disposal, bearing in mind also the values. But also I'd like to widen this value debate a bit. Isn't it also that it's actually in our interest to have the values? Because values can be very, they can be redefined and they can be used selectively. But if we think of the interest, that it is in our interest to have the freedom of speech, it is in our interest to have the rule of law system, it is in our interest to trust the authorities and build the structure so that we can trust them. Mm -hmm. And they support each other so that the trust to authorities can be built on the rule of law, so the interconnectivity there. And the unification, of course, is difficult in the sense that when, anyways, the context is is full of variables and the fragmentation of society's existing trend, not only within the countries, but also between the countries, within EU, within NATO, etc., because of the blurred context and the blurred background. That's why we need to be specifically, uh, strategically aware mm. of what we are doing. And this is where this detection element comes into picture. We have to know what is going around and no conspiracy theories, no panic. No, uh, as I say, unified, or let's say one-colored or two-colored black-white thing. That's also not the case anymore. And this is why this international cooperation is, is useful and it needed, and the exchange of information is essential for building some kind of a uniform picture about what is going on. Ch Russia was mentioned. Russia is giving us a lot of good case material <coughs> to learn about what is going on. But China is doing exactly the same thing, but in a lot more subtle way. And this is something also that I probably, if you allow me one more minute, mm -hmm. is that how many of you have had something to do with Russia during your lifetime, you know, been there, worked there or something like that? Wow. Okay, great number. What about China? How many of you have visited China or have something to do with China or have studied or lived or something? Very good. So there's a good balance. This is a very specific audience because if you do this, usually you get a lot on Russia, very little on China. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our handicaps. We don't know our adversaries. Okay. Thank you very much, Christy. I'd like to open to the floor and I believe we have roving microphones. So this gentleman um, had his hand up here first, um, just at the back, and we'll come to you then. Next. <laughs> Hello, my name is Paul Vigatti, I'm a member of the Institute for International and European Affairs. Um, I find this uh, somewhat ironic uh, that in uh, 2019, uh, the level of uh, and the quality of communication uh, between uh, Russia and uh, the West is lower than it was 30 years ago at the height of the Cold War. Um, at the same time, uh, we have um, American withdrawal from the INF Treaty. Now I know uh, that uh, you know, blame is uh, perhaps liberally distributed about the end of the INF Treaty. We have a new Star Treaty which is due to expire in 2021. Uh, this means that the whole um, armory of 
uh, treaties and international understandings in relation to nuclear armaments threatens to come to an end. Now, I know there are um, other factors entering in. Uh, the world has changed and China has entered on the scene. But it seems to me that uh, against this background, uh, to qualify uh, the need for dialogue, uh, to put it in inverted commas and to call it a mantra is not doing justice. Uh, we need to talk about the future of the world. Uh, we need to talk to Russia. We need to talk to everybody involved. Okay, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, actually, if you don't mind, I might take three <coughs> questions and then and then we'll, we'll respond and then and then come to another. So if I take this gentleman here in the cream, and if we can make sure the microphone is uh, is on. Thank you. And then we'll run to that person. Oh, yeah. uh, Ronan Tynan, a filmmaker, yeah. co-founder of S Brands Production, a member of the IAEA. Uh, I, I was very interested in, the, in all presentations, but I think the first presentation by Kirsten Ryan made a very good point about new threats, but I would put it to all of the panelists that one of the fundamental problems in dealing with new threats is to actually stand up for our values. And I was delighted to hear Russia mentioned today because I'm particularly interested in Syria. And the way Russian propaganda actually works through social media is the simple projection of lies. For example, it commits war crimes on a virtual daily basis. It bombs hospitals. And we had a very interesting case study, Madam Chairperson, in the Irish Times just in the last couple of days when the Russian ambassador, I think, wrote a letter to the paper defending Russia's various crimes. And he was quickly corrected when he attempted to uh, shall we say, uh, disown responsibility for targeting hospitals, when Malachi Brown, a very distinguished Irish journalist who works at the New York Times and has produced a magnificent 12-minute video, which you can easily Google and find, where the New York Times showed in a 12-hour period, Russia targeted and bombed 12 hospitals. And they actually used the voices. They had the voice uh, narrative from the pilot. Final point, Madam Chairperson, but very important. Uh, the, the, Russia really is after the minds, the th thought leadership in our own societies. It is undermining our democracies. But what really alarms me is we're not actually confronting that reality. I think it, I'm not, we can deal with this very peacefully by simply accepting that our media, that we have this fake news problem, but it's being primarily directed by these very powerful powers. And I also I, I did acknowledge the point about China. I think I won't go on now, but... Thank I think you. perhaps that's uh, enough. Uh, so we, we've a lot to respond to. I might even just take those two, and then I have this gentleman, this gentleman um, afterwards. So if I can quickly get a response, uh, maybe from you, Serenus, if you don't mind. Uh, so the, the first uh, comment, uh, it spoke about you know that conversations between Russia and the West, they seem to actually communicate less now than in the Cold War, so that's one point. And the second point is that the values, as Kirsty was saying, are being undermined through social media um, and I guess that's a, a cyber security issue. So, Serena, would you mind just speaking to that briefly? Yeah, because something like the question is also about We need to speak with the Russians. I think, yes, we need to speak with the Russians at the expert level, for sure. But the problem is that in most of this dialogue, and I'm participant in a couple of formats, uh, the EU level, and uh, the problem with all this dialogue is that, for example, if you take militarization of Arctic, okay, you take Kola, they're building ports, and they say, okay, we need EU and uh, Finnish cooperation in ecology. In a sense, we may call this, I don't want to, to say this word starting with S or she, okay? We may call this mess. And then you clean the sea. This is a form of dialogue. In a sense, they have the policy of accomplished fact. They move in, they build a base, for example, military base. And then they say, okay, you guys come in. Okay, the Nordics are you for clean, for green nature. You come in and you clean the sea. After we did everything and we have the military port, all the facility and you know, all the capabilities you know, to attack you, and then you clean the sea. The same is in the south. And I think uh, everywhere, wherever you go, when it comes to the, I mean, the context is very dangerous because I mean, we have Trump right now. I mean, he's also not you know, the biggest power for the Western world. But, uh,
basically this reminds me of the situation where you come into the prison cell, you have like gang leader who you sit, you know, like baboon. And you come in and you say, look, I mean, let's talk something, let's discuss it. I mean, this is, this reminds this kind of situation where there is a kind of, on one side you have escalation, on another side you want somebody to have a dialogue. I think that this kind of cultural approach, I think is problematic in itself. So I, I would like to stop here. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I'm sure we have plenty more to discuss, maybe over tea and coffee. Now, this gentleman was waiting, uh, if I take, if you can keep it to a brief question and we'll come to you then, and, and we'll take that lady at the back then. Thank you. I wanted to raise the issue of social resilience. In the event of a physical or a cyber attack on critical infrastructure, in all of the countries represented here today, the level of social resilience is very, very low in comparison with Japan, and a better example would be Cuba. So that hasn't been discussed at all. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping that brief as well. I forget the microphone, if we switch it on, and we... Oh, you have one, thank you. I do have it, yes. Uh, yes, hello. I'm from the Ambassador of Georgia. Do you hear me? Uh, so thank you very much for your very interesting uh, speeches and remarks, and of course, I uh, would like to thank very much the organizers of this very, very nice event. Uh, my question will be regarding the Russia again, because uh, as I don't understand wh where we go, it's, it's Russia that brings the threats to the security of the European Union. And all the speakers have mentioned this point uh, regardless of, 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 of other, of other uh, points as well. Um, and who, who else, if not Georgia, knows well and, uh, what, what, what it means to be in a neighborhood of that, uh, of that state? Uh, I think that the most uh, countries who are suffering from the Russia are, the, are the, the immediate neighborhood. And the Eastern Partnership, the uh, majority of, of whom are suffering with occupation coming from the Russia, is something that needs to be to, uh, said in a more bold way. Uh, the 2008 war of Russia Georgia is not over. It's still on because we do see that uh, we call it the Caribbean annexation of the country itself, of the territories, because we see that they are time to time they are they are moving the border deeper into the country. We don't react, we don't respond because once we respond, we will have another 2008 war. We see what is happening with Ukraine, with the annexation of Crimea. We see what's happening with the east part of Ukraine as well. We see the reaction uh, of the West, the sanctions. We see the, uh, for instance, the expel from the Council of Europe of, of Russian uh, uh, because of the annexation of the Crimea. But at the same time, we can witness that just recently Russia was uh, welcomed back to the Council of Europe. So my question will be, what is, it, what is the resilience from the European Union of the West towards Russia? How to stop Russia? How to stop the risks coming from the Russian Federation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then this lady at the back, if we can get a, a microphone to her, and we'll take the three questions at the same time then. Thank you. Question those things and think about them. If we go to the resilience question, um, you know, if our society is attacked, that social resilience, which I'd love to ask you to, uh, you know, uh, tell us a little bit more what you, what you mean about that, but um, if, if you can take it, Christy, because um, I'm just short on time, so if I'll right. get your response and I'll come to you, sir, and then we'll, we'll... You're quite right, and we can see that in the base of our member states that you can roughly divide countries into three. You have the big ones who are very, have their capabilities and the capacities to respond. Then you have the, so to say, frontline countries, the ones that have had this existential military threat from the east in the region. And you can know what countries I would mean there. There, the social capacity to, and the social resilience is higher. And then there is this large number of European countries that have not been really threatened by anything during the, after the war, actually. And even in the war, the threat was different. So for them, it, this means a kind of a change in your thinking. And that's exactly where media is then needed, mm. to educate people, and that for that we need the quality media. And for that also, for the propaganda part also, to comment on that, that it's not about what you print, but it's about what, and what you read, but what you believe. And this education of media literacy, education of people actually seeing that there are threats, that you are also a target. Check before you share. 
consider yourself, if you're an authority, that you can be under this very old-fashioned intelligence operation. You can easily be a target. You might have access to critical infrastructure information, even being an engineer there, because that, for instance, is the target. And the resilience is actually not about preventing things today. It's about how you revive and how do you solve the problem which is already there. And I think that this kind of admiring the problem phase should be over. We know exactly what is going on in the large space, but we are the elite in this room in the sense we have access to information, we have education, we have access to people, maybe documentation, meetings like this. We know, and we also have the responsibility to share our knowledge and to share the resilience response that is needed for the greater audience. I think we all should do that, particularly for younger generation for whom the political, the level of political interest is, is very low. And this is about this gathering information and getting the best practices of agencies or other authorities. That's exactly what the Center of Excellence is doing. We are gathering experts, practitioners, and also multidisciplinary manner to discuss and to share the best practices. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, so I think media literacy, that, that seems to be a, a key thing that we should be establishing a little bit more of. Um, Serena, if I can come to you to that last point, you know, how should the EU be resilient when threats are coming from, for example, Russia, as our question had said there? You know, if they're acting on different rules, you, you spoke about narratives, how do we address that? So what should, in your opinion, be the EU response to those actions? I think, I mean, when we speak about EU, this is a kind of very big generalization because we have separate, different countries, and our colleagues mentioned here different groups of the countries. Uh, and the Russian approach usually is uh, to have bilateral relations and to establish bilateral rules of game, you know, with particular countries. And in a sense, uh, this means also certain exclusion, even, you know, for example, Finnish Russian relations, for example, also that specific, you know, Finlandization as such means also exclusion you know, from the general pool of the countries, let's say at the EU level, I mean, I'm not talking about NATO issue, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But this means like exclusion. And I think response is uh, everywhere in EU, you know, to have um, proper public sector. I mean, in some of the countries, especially in East Central Europe, what you get recently, in the recent, like, let's say 20 years, you have um, smaller and smaller public sector every time. And then, you know, it's a question, if firefighters are coming, if, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, whatever police is able to react and then we ask something from the society I mean when you don't have proper provision of public services in a sense you when you have less and less state mm. okay so on another side of the border you have state centered system which has for example like if you take in the, the Russian military so-called the uh, political directorate which is already uh, uh, kind of um, refurbished and reborn very recently, it has 11,000 people, uh, psychologists, um, uh, uh, political officers, priests, I mean, and these guys, 11,000, I mean, who has this capacity of 11,000 people thinking about, you know, how to brainwash somebody? And this is in the, only in the military. I'm not talking about other special forces, etc., 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 who are doing all this. I don't talk about the Russian TV. So what is kind of, pro what is the proportion of response? I mean, when you have 11,000 people thinking, I mean, okay, some of them wasting time at this, et cetera, et cetera, not working, but, but in a sense, you have this potential of people who have the degrees, education, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then apparently we don't have like sig signal intelligence, you know, on the Irish side, for example. So we have to take uh, seriously, I think, at EU level as well, not only at the NATO level, you know, this question of balance of power. I mean, this is power relationship is important, especially with Russians and Chinese, because nobody takes you seriously if you don't have power. I mean, they can, you know, play all kinds of ritual games, but, you know, in, in mm. reality, the situation, I served in the Soviet military, so I know the mentality, mm. so I'm just... <laughs> that, that does sound very paternalistic, yeah. though, if you don't mind me saying, you know, is yeah, that not very... It sounds, old yes, yes, but this is a real power, you know, okay. this is a real game. I mean, okay. if you don't have a stick, so somebody. <laughs> okay, plenty to discuss over tea and coffee. In the interest of time, um, I'm going to have to cut it short there, um, but I would... <laughs> Thanks sincerely, uh, Christy Naranen, Professor Serenus Lakish, and uh, Assistant Professor Ed Burke for those insights. We'll take a coffee break until uh, maybe we'll say 5 to 11 if I can get you back here. Our conversations later on are going to be on the digital revolution.
and then on sustainability. <coughs> so you can take a chance to stretch your legs, ask all the questions to our contributors that you didn't get to ask, um, and think about what, what else we might need to be doing. So thank you sincerely. Please give thanks to our...